Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining myself, Jim Griffin of Derivative Logic, for our Q1 2024 interest rate outlook. And there is an opportunity to ask questions um, both along the way at the end. I anticipate this taking oh, maybe 15, 20 minutes or so with some time left over for Q&A. All right, without further ado, let's dive in. So our agenda for the next 15 or 20 minutes is just a quick overview about us as a firm, literally like a 10 second commercial. We'll do a high level overview of the macro economy and the credit market updates, specifically what we're seeing in commercial real estate, as well as the interest rate environment with um, how things stand now, as well as how we expect them uh, to unfold into the first quarter of next year. So without further ado, what we are are essentially risk advisors to lots of different types of entities in different industries. Um, we do do quite a bit of business in the commercial real estate industry, but are also quite active with Native American tribes, uh, nonprofits, municipalities, uh, financial institutions, entities like that in their management of interest rate and exchange rate risk. And all of us at Derivative Logic are highly experienced uh, folks that really spend most of their lives sitting on the derivative desks at large banks. Uh, myself specifically, I have about 25 years uh, in this risk advisory business, spending most of my time again at banks and focusing on interest rate and exchange rate risk. Jumping right into the most complicated slide of the deck, thought I'd sort of front load this one because it's sort of hard to look at. This just gives you a sense of the current um, economic environment in terms of is it loose or really restrictive um, as the Fed will often profess. Basically what this chart is is it shows you a handful of things. Um, the white line is an index that we pay attention to quite a bit. Um, that's compiled by Goldman Sachs and takes into account everything from the current level of the Fed funds rate, treasury bond yields, corporate credit spreads, um, how the stock market is trading, as well as a trade weighted exchange rate for the dollar against many other currencies. And diametrically opposed to the situation that we exhibited in our last uh, rates outlook um, back in October, where things were pretty tight, financial conditions um, as exhibited by this index have loosened quite a bit um, since then. So even though the Fed hasn't actually cut interest rates, um, markets, as we all know, is sort of smelled or uh, intimated that they've been around the corner. We've seen some decent stock market rallies uh, over the last, say, month or so. And all of these things in combination have made financial conditions looser. Not particularly what the Fed wants, but it's just a reflection of sort of many components in the financial and business marketplace starting to lean toward a world of lower interest rates um, as opposed to interest rates that are staying static and just a, a steadily um, growing economy or one that is emerging from uh, a very restrictive stance that we saw from the Fed hiking so many times over a short period of time. The state of credit uh, broadly, but most specifically in commercial real estate, as I'm sure we're all seeing this, um, we're sort of in a unique position in that we see credit activity in various sectors and in commercial real estate specifically um, in certain sectors all day long from many different types of lenders, be they banks, uh, debt funds, bridge lenders, things like that. And I'd say the takeaway from what we're seeing over the last few months is obviously definitely lower volume um, of closes. Um, high interest rates are definitely subduing refinance activity, seeing many borrowers um, wanting to refinance out of their current loan but can't and are being forced to um, engage in some type of extension uh, of that loan and also extend the hedges that they had on place uh, with those loans. And there's about a 61.7% 
decline in multifamily sales through the third quarter. Um, credit spreads are historically high right now. There's obviously much less um, credit available for those high risk transactions that we saw all the time, say over a year ago or so. Um, and of course, any private sources of capital are being very, very selective these days, either doing nothing at all, or if they are doing things at all, being very, very selective in what they're doing. So again, many of our viewers would probably agree with what we're seeing, as it's pretty broad and has been kind of in existence for a while now. Um, looking to inflation, as that is one of the guiding uh, buoys, if you will, for what the Fed does in terms of raising or cutting interest rates. As I'm sure we'd all agree that yes, inflation is coming down um, notably uh, month after month and quarter after quarter, but it's definitely not a straight line. There's been lots of bumps in the road. And in commercial real estate uh, specifically, because that's most of our attendees uh, into this webinar today, one of the rubbing points is really one of the largest components of the consumer price index that is remaining um, abnormally high or sticky, if you will, that frankly lots of folks in the industry don't really agree with, um, meaning not agreeing with it in that they really don't agree with the data that the Fed is using to make its evaluation of inflation and the state of inflation um, and feel that it's too high and it's very lagging. But the specific spot about it is, um, is really the shelter component to CPI. The Fed is laser focused on CPI in general and specifically the shelter component. Again, because it's showing a very high level relative to all the other components of CPI. Um, it definitely lags. Um, if you were to take this shelter component out of CPI, you'd see CPI uh, being very low, you know, much lower than the Fed's 2% target already, basically eliminating the need to keep interest rates high and definitely making a case for rate cuts and rate cuts immediately. But the Fed really doesn't care about what anyone in commercial real estate feels should be the correct measure of CPI and they're gonna stick with the model that they're using, which again shows what many feel is uh, a level of CPI that's artificially high. Um, if you want to sort of delve into these other sources of gauges of CPI, one of the most actively observed ones outside of the Bureau of Labor Statistics version of CPI is that last bullet there called the Penn State ACY Alternative Inflation Index. Uh, which shows inflation right now being almost zero um, and slightly negative. Check out that website in the deck that you're able to download at the end of this webinar and you can observe their data and how they calculate it. Um, but in all fairness, um, against the Fed, and if you're, you're really truly unbiased as to inflation gauges and how they're used, um, just as this gauge of inflation is um, lagging, meaning it's artificially high in the eyes of many. It was also artificially moving higher when inflation was moving higher. So it is sort of two sides of this coin. You can't really call it bad on the way down if you weren't calling it bad on the way up. It goes both ways. Um, taking a look at the Treasury yield curves and how they reflect um, the state of uh, the economy and interest rates and where the economy might be headed. Um, this is a useful chart that we look at also on an active basis. It basically shows the treasury yield difference between the three month treasury and the 10 year treasury and how they differ over time and how it can be used as a predictor of recessions in the past and its potential usefulness for predicting a recession in the future. So what this chart basically shows you is the most specific point of note is that gray line right in the middle. That's zero, meaning there would be no difference in the yield between the three month and the 10 year treasury. And the blue line, which again plots that yield difference. 
So what this chart is telling you is that every time the treasury yield difference between those two maturities inverts, it's usually a pretty common harbinger for a looming recession. And we see this all the way back to the 70s, which is um, the first recession that it called, if you will. Then moving on through the mid 70s, late 70s, 80s, et cetera, you can see every red bar vertical is a recession and that the yield spread between the three month and the 10 year inverted just before each of those recessions. So all told, it's been a fairly accurate predictor of when a recession would show up uh, for the most part. Um, if you look to the far right, you can see how inverted right now this yield curve is, meaning the yield difference between the three month and the 10 year. By the way, I don't know who's in the background, but there is a lot of pings and noises um, that everyone can hear, just so you know. It's quite active. It almost sounds like an amusement park. Someone on the administrator end may want to turn down their volume or mute that a little bit. But back to this chart. If you go to the right side of the chart, you can see how inverted this uh, yield difference is. And frankly, the fact that we could avoid a recession completely uh, and get inflation down and have the Fed start cutting rates with this degree of inversion, frankly, would be a miracle. And it would be a huge outlier as seen on this chart. It would be highly, highly unusual. So that kind of tells us that we could be in a very short, mild recession already and could conceivably um, be in one in the first quarter of next year, which is frankly our view of a mild, short recession. Um, again, that is opposed to what many think, but that is our current view. And this chart helps us to form that view. So moving right along, um, as we all know in, uh, finance and debt and fixed and floating rate loans and hedging that interest rate risk. It's really all about the, um, it's really all about the SOFR curve, which you see here uh, charted. This curve is from our website. There's a link to our website of these curves at the bottom of this particular slide, again, which you'll be able to uh, download at the end of the webinar. But what this uh, curve is projecting is that one month term so far um, is already at its peak. And just as the Fed keeps talking about rate cuts and implying them through its dot plot, so far will begin to move lower. And it'll move lower sort of in lockstep with the Fed rate cuts and will begin to move lower just before they actually cut. And we'll bottom out somewhere between say 3.3% or whatnot, right around November, January of 2027, um, before it sort of flatlines there for a while. Now, while these forward curves are widely viewed and used, um, if you look back at history, they're actually terrible predictors of what SOFR will actually do. But probably most of us on this webinar can agree that yes, interest rates will move lower someday, probably beginning next year. Our view is May, just so you know, would be the first rate cut. And that would also be the time before we'd see one month term so for really start to, to move lower in any meaningful way. Um, if you look at this same curve over time in the past, you can see how the market's viewpoint of interest rate moves or cuts has really changed over time. You have that same SOFR forward curve plotted at three different points in time. The yellow line is today. Again, it's the same curve as this side, just as, as this slide just displayed a little differently. Um, you have the red line, which is the SOFR curve um, a month ago, and the blue line six months ago. So what this basically tells you is that, yes, markets still believe that SOFR has peaked, just like we do. But now the market is expecting a much more aggressive path of interest rate cuts than they did a month ago. And for interest rates to end up after all of those rate cuts at a much lower level than they do or did rather a month ago. Of course, that remains to be seen. 
Yes, the Fed, as via the Fed meeting and Fed uh, rate decision announcement about an hour ago, the Fed is claiming they will cut next year, so those will happen. And obviously, the curves uh, reflect that. What about the 10-year Treasury? Well, um, just know if you don't know already, the Fed doesn't really impact the movements of the 10-year Treasury. The Fed funds rate, the rate that the Fed moves up or down as they hike or cut, um, is a very short-term rate, whereas the 10-year Treasury yield is a 10-year rate. Um, so they don't quite have as much control over it. And it can move in very different directions than the Fed funds rate does or other short-term rates do, like the two-year Treasury yield or even SOFR. But our view is basically that at the end of the day, the 10-year will probably end up somewhere around 2% higher um, than the real rate, the real rate being the 10-year Treasury yield less the rate of inflation. Said another way, if the Fed is actually successful in getting inflation down to their 2% target, um, it's say in the next year or two, it's probably not that likely that the 10-year Treasury yield would fall a whole lot below 4% um, either next year or the year after. Of course, that remains to be seen, but the current 10-year Treasury yield forward curve, which again is also on our website with the link there, um, basically agrees uh, with our view, showing that it's basically going to um, bottom out somewhere around 4% or just below, above it. Um, it's 4.05% right now after the Fed decision. Um, so about three months ago, the Fed, if you examine their communications, their statements of economic projections, et cetera, believe that a economic soft landing is pretty much guaranteed with inflation continuing to fall, unemployment ticking higher, but not any kind of disaster uh, in the jobs market, uh, allowing them to slowly and steadily cut interest rates. And from today's release of their statement of economic projections, they still do believe that a soft landing in, uh, is guaranteed. With inflation starting to ease to around 2.8% by the end of this year, and them achieving their 2% target either uh, late 2025 or 2026. Um, their projections imply about 75 basis points of rate cuts uh, this year to around a Fed funds level of four and three quarters near year end. By the way, the Fed funds rate is five and a half right now. The market is expecting more rate cuts at this moment of around 125 basis points, obviously implying a much lower Fed funds rate. They'll likely meet somewhere in the middle by the end of the year. Markets expect the first Fed rate cut in March. We're thinking more like May or June. But no matter what the market or we believe, those rate cuts will probably end up being weighted toward the second half of the year. So if they do enter into a cut before June, it'll probably be just one. They'll probably pause, wait and see how it goes before they engage in the other two or three cuts in the latter half of 2024. But like we discuss with many borrowers and market analysts any day, uh, every day, we're really not going to see ultra low interest rates for years if we see them again at all. Um, it's going to take a very, very long time and things would have to be quite disruptive globally and economically for, say, the Fed funds rate to fall, say, all the way down to 1% or so. Don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So get that out of your mind. So here's a summary of our expectations. We've only got just a few slides less, left since we're coming up on 20 minutes now. Inflation will keep easing, but will it'll be a bumpy road to um, the Fed's 2% target, which frankly, we don't think they're gonna meet until 2025 at the soonest. So that's probably an inflation level of around 2.8% or so um, at the end of the year. Um, the Fed is absolutely dovish now, meaning they are absolutely leaning toward rate cuts. They will not hike again. We said that three months ago. 
but they it's very unlikely they're going to hike again, that it's all about cuts now. And as I said earlier, we're not really expecting the first cut until May at the earliest, but probably June. Um, the Fed funds target level would, will remain well above um, inflation for you know years uh, in the future. So if inflation even does fall below or at the Fed's target of 2%, the Fed funds rate would be well above that, say 4% or higher, meaning they're not going to cut Fed funds below 4% or so probably uh, by the end of the year or even in 2025. The Treasury yield curve will continue flattening. Rate volatility, which particularly impacts the cost of interest rate caps, is still um, quite high historically, although it is trending lower. Um, it will not automatically continue to trend lower. There will be bouts of spikes in rate volatility. So yes, all that said, rate cap costs will generally decline slowly but surely, but there will be spikes of higher costs along the way. Because again, this is going to be a bumpy road uh, of rate cuts over time. Um, the employment rate will rise, meaning the jobs market will worsen, but probably not markedly so. Um, with the unemployment rate rising from its 3.7% level now to probably above 4% by the end of the year, around 4.1%, 4.2%. As I said earlier, um, it's very conceivable that we could be in a technical recession already right now. Uh, and if we're not now easily in early 2024, but keep in mind, if it is a recession, it would be very short and very shallow. That remains to be seen. No one really calls a recession before we're actually in one. Um, the Fed or anyone else official will only be able to call a recession um, after we've already been in it for a month or two. So that's a TBD uh, in early 2024. Really don't see any reason for credit spreads to narrow anytime soon. Don't really expect to see that until Q2 or later. And the, while the stock market's rallying today and will continue to have a positive slant due to the Fed pivoting to rate cuts officially, um, it will also be a bumpy road for the stock market as those, most of those cuts will probably come later rather than sooner. And of course, due to the dysfunctional political environment, there'll continue to be a lot, a lot of focus on the U.S. deficit and just the um, not great fiscal picture of the U.S. Here's actual numbers of our forecast. A lot of this I've already said, but you can see the number there. Um, let's just review them quickly and then I'll open it up to Q&A. This is all for quarter end Q1 of 2024. So Fed funds still at 5.5% because again, we're not expecting the first cut until May, which is Q2 or June. SOFR will be pretty close to its current level levels, maybe slightly lower. The two year at four and a quarter, it's just below 450 right now. The five year just above 4%, it's slightly higher than that level right now. The 10 year around 4%, um, it's about 4.1% right now. Um, oil, which has been on a falling trend, that falling trend will stop um, once economic activity looks to be on a firm upswing. Um, and that will probably happen by the end of the quarter. Retail gas will stay low as a result, and you can see the rest for headline inflation, core inflation, et cetera, which are frankly still pretty high at the end of the first quarter of next year. And we don't really expect uh, to see any markedly lower inflation until the second half of um, 2024. The Fed, like I said, is projecting around 2.8% for headline inflation at the end of 2024, just for perspective. Um, we do ra frequently advise borrowers on different types of hedging structures that are working and highlight things they should be thinking about now. Um, that's buying back or eliminating any SOFR floor in their floating rate loans that exist. 
it's kind of like every day you wait, um, that floor gets more and more expensive to you and you want to be in a position to take advantage of falling rates as they occur and be unhinged or unlimited from any floor in your loan agreement. So take a look at that. And if you have a floor, try to negotiate it away. Um, we're seeing a greater usage of step up strikes in interest rate caps to reduce the cost of extending an interest rate cap or purchasing a new one in the event of a refinance. If you don't know what we mean by step up caps, reach out. I'm not going to bore everybody with an explanation of that now, but essentially it's just the level of the strike over the term of the cap increases. Um, there's still a big argument to be made toward buying forward starting interest rate hedges, like forward starting swaps, forward starting caps, because due to the inverted nature of uh, the forward curves, those end up being a fair amount of che cheaper for a borrower than just buying a spot starting or a, a hedge that starts today rather than a month or two or three months from now. And then also we see a fair amount of activity in the buy down of uh, interest rate cap strikes to create a lower um, fixed rate synthetically. So many of the loan extensions that we're seeing and the cap extensions that we're seeing, all of the strikes on rate caps that are involved or part of those extensions are in the money, meaning they are much lower than where SOFR is today basically equating to a fixed rate loan for that borrower. And many borrowers are choosing to lower the strike even more, paying out of pocket to do that, just to create an, an even lower fixed rate for themselves. So if you're not really familiar what your pain threshold is in terms of a level of SOFR that your deal can tolerate, you should. Um, that's critical now, especially in this time of soon to be falling interest rates. And if you need help identifying what that is, reach out to us. It's something we do all the time, every day for borrowers. Don't be shy. Last but not least, before we do the Q&A, just know that we publish quite a bit of market and interest rate commentary um, via what's called our Straight to Smart newsletter and more of our thematic uh, articles called the DL Reports, straight to smarts on the left, DL Reports on the right. And you can subscribe um, to these publications right here on the right of the screen that you see here. If you don't want to do it now, you can always go to our website to the bottom of our homepage and that um, subscribe block is there. So since we've got a few minutes left, if we can go back maybe to the chat and see some of the questions that were asked, I'll try to address a couple of them. Um, let's see, anything that would change our outlook? Absolutely, most certainly. And that would be a much longer, deeper recession um, that would cause the Fed to act more aggressively in terms of rate cuts and would bring rates down sooner. But the probability of that is pretty low. It's more the opposite. Better economic for, um, performance than most expect. Um, if the economy does turn out to perform better really than anyone expects, um, there's really no reason for the Fed to cut interest rates aggressively. They, they could cut some, but nowhere near as much as what the market is projecting or even what the Fed is projecting at this point. Um, it'll probably just turn out to be a sort of slow and steady, resilient economy through the first quarter of next year without any major positivity or negativity, frankly, outside of some kind of geopolitical blow up, which is always possible and can kind of wreck things or at least slow things down. That's always possible. Um, uh, we also have a question about accreting caps in that we are seeing, um, believe it or not, a fair number of construction loans happening these days with, of course, a draw feature to that loan where the borrower is drawing down from the loan in pieces. Um, the loans are floating rate, and many of them require interest rate caps along with them. And sometimes borrowers with that type of loan structure will ask the borrower to buy, or the lender will ask the borrower to buy an interest rate cap that has a notional amount of the fully drawn loan amount. 
and that can be an expensive interest rate cap. Sort of the best practice or best approach to that is not to buy a cap with the fully drawn loan amount that for a loan that really won't be fully drawn until months or years from now, but structure the cap such that the notional amount in the cap is synced with the proposed draw schedule on the loan, where the amount of the cap increases over, the, over time and locks step with the draw schedule. And borrowers can save a lot of money by structuring their cap that way. It equates to a much, much cheaper uh, interest rate cap. Um, I'll just wait literally another five seconds or so for any other questions. Not seeing them populate. Okay, just for the sake of time and to keep this short, our time is up at 30 minutes. Just know you can always reach out to us for really anything. Our job is really to create value and give away free information and insights all day long. That's what we do, so don't be shy. Um, and don't hesitate to subscribe to our newsletters. Um, we'll be doing these quarterly interest rate forecasts, just so you know if this is your first time, every single quarter. Um, the next one will be in March. We're also going to publish an annual rate forecast. Um, there won't be a webinar for it, just a PDF publication in early January that'll be much more uh, much deeper and much more detailed than these quarterly webinars. So look for that as well. And thanks for joining us. We'll see you in next quarter.